Hello and welcome to another episode of Analyzing Mormonism. We are going to talk today about Moroni. So this last September was the 200th anniversary of when Joseph Smith said he was visited by Moroni, which was September 21st of 1823. Pretty sure. <laughs> anyway, so we've just collected a bunch of sources about Moroni. I've talked about some of these on TikTok, but we're just putting them, presenting them here and some more, some more that I haven't shared here. And actually, this is not, or historically, in a historical sense, this isn't actually the 200th anniversary for Moroni, and we're going to talk about that today. So we have this little slideshow presentation. Let me get it up. So who was Moroni? And there's a little toad. That's a cute toad. Yeah, it's a do cute their toad. toes really look like that? I actually don't know. This is an AI version. I don't think they do. <laughs> He's got like really long nails. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is this newspaper article. It's from the Palmyra Freeman. And it was published on August 11th of 1829. So I'm not going to claim that this is the earliest, but this is the earliest I can find. And on the church's master list of, of all the articles that are about the church or about the restoration, this is the first one. So I'm pretty sure this is the very first time that the angel is spoken about, including Joseph Smith's journals or his family's journals or his family records. This is the first time that an angel visiting Joseph Smith was ever talked about. So yeah, that's wild. So 1829. So what is that? Um... 1829 minus 1823 is how many years later, supposedly? Six. Six years difference. So, yeah. Okay, so we're going to read this one. The greatest piece of superstition that has ever come within our knowledge now occupies the attention of a few individuals of this quarter. It is generally known and spoken of as the Golden Bible. Its proselytes give the following account of it. In the fall of 1827, a person by the name of Joseph Smith of Manchester, Ontario County, reported that he had been visited in a dream by the Spirit of the Almighty and informed that in a certain hill in that town was deposited at this golden Bible containing an ancient record of a divine nature and origin. After having been thrice thus visited, as he states, he proceeded to the spot, and after penetrating Mother Earth a short distance, the Bible was found, together with a huge pair of spectacles. He had been directed, however, not to let any mortal being examine them under no less penalty than instant death. They were therefore nicely wrapped up and excluded from the vulgar gaze of poor wicked mortals. It was said that the leaves of the Bible were plates of gold, about eight inches long, six wide, and one-eighth of an inch thick. That's thick. <laughs> On which were engraved characters or hieroglyphics. By placing the spectacles in a hat and looking into it, Smith could, he said so at least, interpret these characters. An account of this discovery was soon circulated. Okay, he, so... He wait. puts the spectacles in a hat, according to... Mm. Yeah, I think I heard some where he takes one of this, one or either of the stones out, because I don't know the... Because those glasses are huge. They're like nine inches. I think they're pretty big, so I don't think they would fit in a hat. So, yeah, that doesn't make sense. I think he had to pull the stones to, out. You'd have to... Oh, you just put the stones uh, yeah, out the, of the spectacles. Out of the spectacles. They're like oh, in a figure okay. eight. And I think you'd have to pop the stones out and stick one or both. Um, I don't actually know how that works. Um, mm -hmm. But I thought it was interesting. So they say it was reported in the fall of 1827. So like they're even predating it to 27. It was certainly not 23. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Um, did you have any other thoughts? Um, that he is described as the spirit of the almighty and mm -hmm. not as a person named Moroni. Right. And what does that mean? The spirit the, to me that to me, like when we feel the spirit or when I felt the spirit as a member of the church, it's just a peaceful feeling. It's this like sort of voice in your head. Um, so that doesn't really to me, that doesn't even sound like a being who was visited in a dream. First of all, it's a dream by the spirit of the almighty. So I don't know. Um, anyway, it's super not an angel at this point mm -hmm. in time. Can I say your AI version is is. Um... Giving Keanu, Keanu Reeves. Reeves. <laughs> giving Keanu Joseph Reeves. was visited in dream by Keanu Reeves. <laughs> he wishes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this. So I also wanted to point out that in the testimony of the three witnesses, and this was written in April of 1830. Actually, I think it was probably before. It was published in 1830. But anyway, when they gave their testimonies, there's the angel is never named as Moroni. It's just an angel appeared to them. And say with the eight witnesses, um, there's no the angel isn't named. He's just an, an angel. So yeah, in the testimony of the eight witnesses, they're they're not visited by an angel. They're just Joseph just has the plates already. There is a theory that there are two sets of plates that Joseph was working with and that he returned one to the angel and that he had a second set of plates that he showed to the white witnesses. And one of the reasons for this is that Joseph Smith Sr. gives a very different account of what the plates look like. He's like, they're bigger, thinner, they have less sheets. Anyway, that's a whole different thing. But maybe we can talk about that. <laughs> maybe we can talk about that at a different time. There's two different ones. What? Oh yeah, yeah, it's a whole different thing. 
Okay, so this next account comes from a man named Peter Bowder. So he gave this in October of 1830 and he interviewed Joseph. It wasn't published, I think, until a little bit later. Yeah, 1830. I called at P. Whitmer's house of the purpose of seeing Smith and searching into the mystery of his system of religion and had the privilege of conversing with him alone several hours and of investigating his writings, church records, etc. I improved near four and twenty hours in close application with Smith and his followers. He could give me no Christian experience. But he told me that an angel told him he must go to a certain place in the town of Manchester, Ontario County, where was a secret treasure concealed, which he must reveal to the human family. He went, and after the third or fourth time, which was repeated once a year, he obtained a parcel of plates resembling gold, on which were engraved what he did not understand, only by the aid of a glass, which he also obtained with the plate, by which means he was enabled to translate the characters on the plate into English." He says he was not allowed to let the plate be seen only by a few individuals named by the angel, and after he had a part translated, the angel committed him to carry the plate into a certain piece of woods, which he did. The angel took them and carried them to parts unknown to him, the part translated he had published, and it is before the public entitled the Book of Mormon. Okay, so the angel told him that he must go to a certain place where the treasure was concealed, and he does say that he was visited once a year. He went and after the third or fourth time, which was repeated once a year, he obtained the, the plates. So he, so he even, so by 1830, Joseph has it down that he is going to this place. Um, he had gone to this place every year to, and was visited by Moroni. Even his mom talks about that, although it wasn't published until the 1850s. She talks about him, how he would go out into the woods and come back and he would tell them these grandiose stories of the Native Americans living here. And presumably Joseph was going and visiting this angel and hearing everything from him. So to me, that looks like Joseph Smith's just fabricating this book, and he's doing it from 1823 on. And he's just sitting in the forest thinking up stories thinking up and stories. Then coming back and telling them. Also, um, the angel is not named still. The angel is still not named, but it does say that the angel names people that he can go and show the plates to, which is sort of different from, because Joseph Smith specifically asked if Martin Harris and Lucy Harris could see them, but... Another question, is this angel identified as a person from the Book of Mormon... As in, does Peter Rowder know that? Yeah. I don't, it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like he's just an angel just telling an him angel. where to find treasure so far. Yeah. So I want to reference too. He says, Peter Rowder says that Joseph could give him no Christian experience, which in my mind says he, he could give him no first vision. Uh, like Joseph didn't yeah, see like God. He wasn't talking to God. It right. wasn't a prayer. It wasn't like a burning in his bosom. It was an angel who right. told him where to find treasure. So to me, this says no first vision, but they are talking about the angel. And then with Lucy Maximus' letter, you'll see that again with in the entirety of this letter she doesn't reference seeing god or jesus at all she just talks about this angel so she wrote a letter to her brother solomon mack and this was in january of 1831 january 6th and so she's trying to teach him about the gospel and so i'll go ahead and have you read it okay joseph after repenting of his sins and humbling himself before god was visited by an holy angel whose countenance was as lightning and whose garments were white above all whiteness and gone unto him illegible which inspired him from on high and gone unto him by the means of which was before prepared that he should translate this book. And by reading this, this, our eyes are opened that we can see the situation in which the world near stands, that the eyes of the world are blinded, that the churches have all become corrupted. Yea, every church upon the face of the earth, that the gospel of Christ is nowhere preached. This is the situation in which the world is now in. Okay. So yeah, so she was talking about it to me. She has every reason to tell her brother everything about the first vision and this angel, but the angel is not named and tells him to translate this ancient book. Okay, so this next one it comes from David S. Burnett. This is the David S. Burnett account, and this was on March 7th of 1831. The ignorance and superstition of these fanatics soon conjured up a ghost who they said was often seen and to whom was committed the care of the precious deposit. This tradition made money diggers of many who had neither intelligence nor industry sufficient to obtain a more reputable livelihood. But they did not succeed, and as the money was not dug up, something must be dug up to make money. The plan was laid, doubtless, by some person behind the curtain who selected suitable tools. One Joseph Smith, a perfect ignoramus, is to be a great prophet of the Lord. The fabled ghost, the angel of his presence, a few of the accomplices, the apostles or witnesses of the imposition, and, to fill up the measure of their wickedness and the absurdity of their proceedings, the hidden golden treasure is to be a golden Bible and a new revelation. This golden Bible consisted of metallic plates six or seven inches square, of the thickness of tin and resembling gold. 
the surface of which was covered with hieroglyphic characters, unintelligible to Smith, the finder, who could not read English. <laughs> However, the angel, Ghost, that discovered the plates to him, likewise informed him that he would be inspired to translate the inscriptions without looking at the plates, while an amanuensis would record his infallible reading, all which was accordingly done. Okay, so yeah, the so it conjured up a ghost. Um, they're changing angel to ghost a lot. I wonder if I wonder if they understood that it was a deceased Native American, and they are not Native American, just a deceased person guarding the treasure, because that's typically how it went. That there was a ghost, because I don't know if the people understood that there was a difference between a ghost and an angel, and that's why they're pulling out the two. Hmm. I don't know. I just think it's interesting. Well, in your imagery, he does not look like a Native American. At all. Yeah. So, you, so that's that picture was prompted by some of these other later. Um, accounts that we're going to talk about. So he looks more like a pirate to me. Okay, this next one comes from a man named Abner Cole, and this was on February 14th of 1831. In the commencement, the imposture of the Book of Mormon had no regular plan or features. At a time when the money-digging ardor was somewhat abated, the elder Smith declared that his son Joe had seen the spirit, which he then described as a little old man with a long beard, and was informed that he, Joe, under certain circumstances, eventually should obtain great treasures, and that in due time he, the spirit, would furnish him, Joe, with a book, which would give an account of the ancient inhabitants, antediluvians, of this country, and where they had deposited their substance, consisting of costly furniture, etc., at the approach of the great deluge, which had ever since that time remained secure in his, the spirit's, charge." in large and spacious chambers, in sundry places in this vicinity, and these tidings corresponded precisely with revelations made to and predictions made by the elder smith a number of years before. The time at length arrived when young Joe was to receive the book from the hand of the spirit, and he repaired accordingly, alone and in the night time to the woods and the rear of his father's house, in the town of Manchester, about two miles south of this village, and met the spirits as had been appointed. This rogue of a spirit, who had baffled all the united efforts of the money diggers, although they had tried many devices to gain his favor, and at one time sacrificed a barnyard fowl. Hey, we need to add that to his his animal sacrifice. Yes, yeah, barnyard list. fowl. Add that to the list of animals <laughs> that Joseph killed. Is that just a chicken? Probably. Oh, did you already have chicken? So I didn't reference chicken, but I know it was referenced in Mark Elwood's book. So that's where that probably comes from. Okay. So probably a rooster or a chicken. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully it was a rooster because they're annoying. <laughs> and at one time sacrificed a barnyard fowl. Intended, it would seem, to play our prophet a similar trick on this occasion. For no sooner had he delivered the book according to promise than he made a most desperate attempt to regain its possession. Our prophet, however, like a lad of true metal, stuck to his prize and attempted to gain his father's dwelling, which it appears was near at hand. The father, being alarmed at the long absence of his son, and probably fearing some trick of the spirit, having known him for many years, sallied forth in quest of the youthful adventurer. He had not, however, proceeded far before he fell in with the object of his kind solicitude, who appeared to be in the greatest peril. The spirit had become exasperated at the stubborn conduct of the young prophet, and wishing to keep possession of the book, and out of sheer spite, raised a whirlwind, which was at that particular juncture throwing trunks and limbs of trees. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> so you're telling me that apparently this angel was like, here's the book. Actually, no, I want it back. And Joseph and was like, like, no, it's mine. And then he's huge. like, ah, and there's like a whirlwind of trees like because trunks Joseph and Smith won't give him the book back. That's what it sounds like. Okay. Raised a whirlwind, which was at that particular juncture, throwing trunks and limbs of trees about their ears to <laughs> about their ears besides the elfish sprite had belabored joe soundly with blows had felled him once to the ground and bruised him severely in the side the rescue however was timely joe retained his treasure and returned to the house with his father much fatigued and injured this tale in substance was told at the time the event was said to have happened by both father and son and is well recollected by many of our citizens it will be borne in mind that no divine interposition had been dreamed of at this point Wait, so that's interesting. No divine, mm -hmm. what does he say? No divine interposition. interposition had been dreamed about this period. So this story is still about him treasure digging, essentially. Mm -hmm. He's still getting treasure from a ghost who doesn't want him to have it. And he's like fighting for it rather mm -hmm. than an angel bringing him a plate because you need to bring this into the world. That's a completely different story than right. what this is. Right. Also, the little old man with a long beard. It's just really interesting. Which is very different than the next accounts that we'll see. 
A young man about 23 years of age, somewhere in Ontario County, New York, was visited by an angel. Here, the preacher looked around him, apparently to see if the credulity of the people in this enlightened age could be thus imposed on, who informed him three times in one night that by visiting a certain place in that town, he would have revealed to him something of importance. The young man was disturbed, but did not obey the summons until the following day, when the angel again visited him. At the place appointed, he found in the earth a box which contained a set of thin plates resembling gold, with Arabic characters inscribed on them. The plates were minutely described as being connected with rings in the shape of the letter D, which facilitated the opening and shutting of the book. The preacher said he found in the same place two stones, with which he was enabled by placing them over his eyes and putting his head in a dark corner. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I haven't heard this one. Probably. <laughs> you just, like, put your head in the corner. Okay. <clears throat> to dis <laughs> putting his head in a dark corner to decipher the hieroglyphics on the plates. I <laughs> just like literally putting his head in the corner. Oh, I'm sorry, this, so funny. this we were told was performed to admiration, and now as a result, we have a book which the speaker informed us was the Mormon Bible, a book second to no other, without which the Holy Bible he seemed to think would be of little use. Yeah, so again, angels not named. And no reference to the first vision. Okay, so this next one is from the Fredonia Censor, and this was published on March 7th of 1832. We of this place were visited on Saturday last by a couple of young men styling themselves Mormonites. They explained their doctrine to a large part of the citizens in the courthouse that evening. They commenced by reading the first chapter of Paul's epistle to the Galatians, also by giving an account of their founder, Joseph Smith, then an inhabitant of the state of New York, county of Ontario, and town of Manchester. Having repented of his sins, but not attached himself to any party of Christians, owing to the numerous divisions among them, and being in doubt what his duty was, he had recourse prayer. After retiring to bed one night, he was visited by an angel and directed to proceed to a hill in the neighborhood, where he would find a stone box containing a quantity of gold plates. The plates were six or eight inches square, and as many of them as would make six or eight inches thick, each as thick as a pane of glass. They were filled with characters which the learned of that state were not able to translate. A Mr. Anthony, a professor of one of the colleges, found them to contain something like the Syrian, Chaldean, or Hebrew characters. However, Smith, with divine aid, was able to translate the plates, and from them we have the Mormon Bible, or as they stated it, another revelation to part of the house of Joseph. Okay, so yeah, so visited by an angel, comes in the night. And they talk about Charles Anthon, which, so they just say that none of the learned in the state were able to translate them. So Charles Anthon wouldn't know how to translate this either. This, the Egyptian characters, Rosetta Stone had just been discovered or recently been discovered and had not been deciphered yet, or at least was not known in New York yet. So anyway, so you can reference the episode we did on Charles Anthon, where he spoke out twice against Martin Harris's account. He was like, no, this did not happen. I did not say that these are real characters. I didn't say anything like that. I didn't say... Yeah, anyway, it's a completely opposite story from what Martin Harris was saying. Um, So he said that he had recourse prayer, mm -hmm. and then he was visited by an angel later in his bed. Mm -hmm. So again, no first vision. Yeah. And again, not naming the, the angel. angel. Okay, so then we finally get to Joseph Smith's account in the summer of 1832. And I do think this is the exact same account of when he gives his first first vision, where he sees the Lord. Finally, he himself is talking about being visited by an angel. And it came to pass, when I was seventeen years of age, I called again upon the Lord, and he shewed unto me a heavenly vision, for behold, an angel of the Lord came and stood before me, and it was by night. And he called me by name, and he said the Lord had forgiven me my sins. And he revealed unto me that in the town of Manchester, Ontario County, New York, there was plates of gold, upon which was engraven by Moroni and his fathers, the servants of the living God in ancient days, and deposited by the commandments of God and kept by the power thereof, and that I should go and get them. And he revealed unto me many things concerning the inhabitants of the earth, which since have been revealed in commandments and revelations. And it was on the 22nd day of September, A.D. 1822. And thus he appeared unto me three times in one night, and once on the next day. And then I immediately went to the place, and found where the plates was deposited as the angel of the Lord. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> You're trying to... Trying to... And when his okay, accent inner, coming inner out. Joseph's accent. <laughs> where the plates was deposited. <laughs> As the angel of the Lord had commanded me and straightway made three attempts to get them. And then being exceedingly frightened, I suppose it had been a dream of vision. But when I considered, I knew. <laughs> a dream of vision. 
A dream of vision. <laughs> <laughs> but when I considered, I knew that it was not. Therefore, I cried unto the Lord in the agony of my soul. Why can I not obtain them? Behold, the angel appeared unto me again and said unto me, You have not kept the commandments of the Lord, which I gave unto you. Therefore, you cannot now obtain them, for the time is not yet fulfilled. So an angel comes, the angel's not named, although it's interesting that he does, he does say Moroni's name. This was engraven by Moroni and his fathers, but nowhere does he say that this angel is Moroni. Good point. Yeah. And I think the guy's getting the, or the guy, <laughs> Joseph Smith, it says the 22nd day of September, but I'm pretty sure it's the 21st day of September. He also says, the angel says that you had not kept the commandments of the Lord. I don't remember him giving him commandments because when in his first, first vision, he asked forgiveness of sins. Jesus forgives him or the Lord forgives him. I don't, maybe he, maybe they were vague commandments. Yeah. What were the, uh, disobeying one of the 10 commandments? Like had he murdered? Well, he says the commandments, which I gave it to you. Okay. So this one is by Abigail Harris. And this one was given on November 28th of 1833. And this one is super interesting. Old Mrs. Smith observed that she thought he must be a Quaker as he was dressed very plain. They said that the plates he then had in possession were but an introduction to the gold Bible, that all of them upon which the Bible was written were so heavy that it would take four stout men to load them into a cart, that Joseph had also discovered by looking through his stone the vessel in which the gold was melted from, which the plates were made, and also the machine with which they were rolled. He also discovered in the bottom of the vessel three balls of gold, each as large as his fist. So what? The machine uh, that they made the sheets I know. With? <laughs> I, this is never super interesting. That. I wonder if Joseph at this point hasn't really thought about the fact that he wants this angel to be Moroni. And so everyone's just sort of coming up with their own theories on who he is. She's like, oh, he's probably a Quaker because he's dressed very plain. And uh, yeah, this, so Joseph, I guess the, so there are rumors and especially in the cliques of Mormonism where, where there is a whole vast um, collection of plates in the hill of Camorra and that the church is trying to cover that up. Or something like that. <laughs> Has um, anybody been out there with the with a metal detector? The, the, the church won't let people get off. The church won't let people go and check. But there was this story where this boy, there, there's a family reunion, and this boy fell into a hole, and they had to go fish him out. And it was this man-made room. There was there was kind of the same measurements that Brigham Young talked about when he talked about this this uh, repository full of plates. Anyway, so it's just interesting that she's kind of referencing that, this that there's a whole bunch of plates. The, all of them were the Bible were written. They were so heavy. They would take all these men to load them into a cart. Anyway, but then she's talking about how Joseph put his the stones in, and looked through the stones and saw the vessel in which the gold was melted and, and how they were made and how and they were rolled. Like The vessel, in the bottom of the vessel, three balls of gold, each as large as his fist. I have never heard of this. This is, yeah. this is out of nowhere. <laughs> Okay, this next one's from Willard Chase, and we know Willard Chase from Joseph Smith's treasure digging days, and his sister, I think it was his sister, Sally, who had the green stone. Oh. Yeah. So this is given December 11th of 1833, and this is where the toad story comes in. He repaired to the place of deposit and demanded the book, which was in a stone box unsealed, and so near to the top of the ground that he could see one end of it, and raising it up, took out the book of gold. But fearing someone might discover where he got it, he laid it down to place back the top stone as he found it. And turning round, to his surprise, there was no book in sight. He again opened the box and in it saw the book and attempted to take it out, but was hindered. He saw in the box something like a toad, which soon assumed the appearance of a man and struck him on the side of his head. Not being discouraged at trifles, he again stooped down and strove to take the book, when the spirit struck him again and knocked him three or four rods and hurt him prodigiously. After recovering from his fright, he, he inquired why he could not obtain the plates, to which the spirit made reply, because you have not obeyed your orders. He then inquired when he could have them and was answered thus, come one year from this day and bring with you your eldest brother and you shall have them. Okay, so yeah, that's super interesting. So we've got this toad appearing and there's this theme, it seems like throughout all these is that that Joseph's being harmed by the angel, like the tree trunks and the branches swirling around, and then there's, he's bopped and on he's the like, head. You can't have it. And he's just there's a lot, there's a lot of violence. <laughs> bopped on the head by a toad man. <laughs> and then yeah, the toad is why super Cause interesting because he, he had to fit in the box and then get really big and imposing. So it's it's got to be able to do both. Yeah, and so what's interesting about this? So the toad turned angel tells him you have to bring your brother. 
But then according to this timeline, Alvin dies just a few months later. And so it's like, is this angel spirit toe tricking him? Was his death completely unforeseen by God? I don't know. It's super weird. Or to was think the about. toad not in coats with the Grim Reaper? Like maybe they didn't. Or God, you know. Like they got their paperwork messed up. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, was there anything else you wanted to say on that one? Um, Knocked him three or four rods. Like a rod is pretty far. So like it's a strong toad angel. <laughs> Okay, this next one is from Lemon Copley, and this is given in 1834. And so Lemon Copley was the first time he's named as Moroni. We'll read it first, and then we can talk about it after. It was confirmed to him by Joseph himself, who again related it in the following manner. After he had finished translating the Book of Mormon, he again buried up the plates in the side of a mountain by command of the Lord. Some time after this, he was going through a piece of woods on a bypath when he discovered an old man dressed in ordinary gray apparel sitting upon a log, having in his hand or nearby a small box. On approaching him, he asked him what he had in his box, to which the old man replied that he had a monkey, and for five coppers he might see it. Joseph answered that he would not give a cent to see a monkey, for he had seen a hundred of them. Sounds, sounds like an exaggeration, but okay. <laughs> he then asked the old man where he was going, who said he was going to Charzi. Joseph then passed on, and not recollecting any such place in that part of the country, began to ponder over the strange interview, and finally asked the Lord the meaning of it. The Lord told him that the man he saw was Moroni with the plates. And if he had given him the five coppers, he might have got his plates again. And yeah, this is a super interesting story. So, so he goes into the forest. He passes an old man at the box. He, the guy's in gray. And he's like, hey, what's in your rocks? And he was like, well, I have a monkey in here. And if you give me five coppers, I'll let you see it. Just like, Psh, I've seen a hundred of these. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you money. And then he was told later by the Lord that this man was Moroni. And if he had given him. Five coppers. five coppers he would have seen he would have gotten his plates again so well, super interesting there you go and the lord expects you to pay for your blessings <laughs> okay so this next one so in the messenger and advocate they published oliver's letters a lot of his letters and so one of them was published in february of 1835 so lame Copley was the first time he's named as moroni and this is the second time I believe that the angel Moroni, whose words I have been rehearsing, who communicated the knowledge of the record of the Nephites in this age, saw also, before he hid up the same unto the Lord, great and marvelous things, which were to transpire when the same should come forth. So interesting that the first reference for Moroni is in 1834. 1834 and it's um, by a man who's not, um, who's, I think he becomes disaffected from the church. And I think that's what's happening here. So it's like anti-Mormon literature, basically. So this is very reminiscent of the three Nephites, right? That wander around and they could be anybody. And they're like, oh, yeah. You know, that very like folklore. It is very folklore. Yeah. Like, yeah. oh, you didn't know that it was Moroni because he didn't look anything like Moroni. And he had a monkey in a box. Like he's not on brand, but you just got to yeah. make sure that you're giving any old man five coppers in case... He's if that's all man in a suit, it might be an angel. Okay, so this next one is the Pioneer. It's a newspaper, and it was published in March of 1835. This imposture had its origin in Ontario County, New York, in 1830. The ostensible projector was an idle, worthless fellow by the name of Joseph Smith. The real inventors of the delusion have had adroitness enough to keep dark as yet. Smith pretended that he had found some golden or brass plates, like the leaves of a book, hid in a box in the earth, to which he was directed by an angel in 1827, that the writing on them was in the reformed Egyptian language, that he was inspired to interpret the writing or engraving by putting a plate in his hat. What? <laughs> <laughs> so we're not doing stones anymore, we're doing plates. Wait, no, 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 there's still stones there. Let's... Okay. My engraving by putting a plate in his hat, putting two smooth flat stones, which he found in the box. <laughs> everything he's putting everything oh, in the okay. box. Two smooth hat. flat stones, which he found in the box, in the hat, and putting his face therein, that he could not write. But as he translated, one Oliver Cowdery wrote it down. The next step was to operate upon a superstitious and credulous farmer by the name of Martin Harris and induce him to sell his farm, worth it is said three thousand dollars, to raise funds to print the book. Yeah, it is expensive to print books. It is amazing. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, so engravings by putting a plate in his hat, putting two small flat stones, which found the box in the hat and putting his face therein. So so in this account, he needs all three of them, right? Oh, OK. Oh, 
Well, because like I was literally imagining like a dinner plate. Oh, I was no, like, I think why means... does he need a dinner plate in his hat? <laughs> that's but that a big makes hat. more sense. No, I think he means plate. So I, I've seen other accounts where we should just do a whole episode about the uh, um, the stones and the translation process. But yeah, there's other accounts where you like he lays it on top of it and the words appear almost like a, I guess I picture like a magnifying glass, but the translates. But anyway, that's an interesting account of how to translate. This one is not a story of Moroni per se, but it's a funny story of Joseph Smith's encounters with angels. I'm just adding this in here because it's sort of funny and um, I have other thoughts about it too, I guess. There was a story published in the Evangelical Magazine and Gospel Advocate, and it was published in 1835 on June 6th. And it was published at least mm, three other times. It was published in the Rochester Republican on June 15th. It was also published in the New York uh, Mercury on June 25th and the Rockville Intelligencer on July 18th of 1835. The Mormon Angel. Soon after the notorious imposter Joe Smith of Golden Bible Memory reached the promised land in Ohio with his deluded followers and was getting along with such swimming success in making proselytes and baptizing them in Grand River near Painesville, though he himself baptized not but his disciples in the instance at least which we are about to relate. Word was given out that an angel would uniformly appear, dressed in white, standing on the edge of the water on the opposite side of the river whenever the baptismal rite was administered, to witness and approve the ordinance, to give the celestial messenger a more imposing appearance, and withal, not to dazzle the eye of weak mortals, but too much glory for their feeble organs to behold, the rite was always very prudently administered in the night. The angel was uniformly seen as above described on such occasions. At length, three young men of the place resolved one night, when notice was given that baptism was to be administered and the angel was to appear, that they would see the ghost nearer at hand than across the river. Ah, and feel him too, if tangible, and ascertain whether he were material or immaterial substance. Accordingly, these ghost-daring mortals secreted themselves in the bushes on the side where the angel was to appear, opposite the baptismal administration. The ordinance proceeded, and behold, the angel was there, clothed in white, with a luminous appearance, the wonder and admiration of the Mormon host. Our triune guard now made a plunge. The angel sprung to elude their grasp. Splash, splash goes the water. Deeper and deeper plunge the pursued and the pursuers. Till behold, they had him fast. It was surely material substance. In, in they went, deeper and deeper, clear up to the neck, chin, and eyes of the ghost, dragging him directly through the river to the place of the ceremony, crying out, We've got your angel, his wings are wet and dripping. And behold, on examination by the light, it was the veritable Joe Smith himself, with a sheet wrapped around him and a dark lantern concealed underneath. The above fact we had a few days since from the lips of one of the daring trio by the name of S, now at work in the Frankfurt Furnace, only a few miles from this city. We deemed it too good to be lost. Our readers have it as cheap as we have. So yeah, that's a super funny story to me. Um, this is around the same time that the angel Moroni is first coming out. Um, the angel's name, I guess. There's a story of the baptism. There's an angel that appears across the way, like giving his, I guess he has to witness for the baptism, <laughs> like we do in the temple or in just in general. And then these three guys tackle him and they realize that it's Joseph and that he's just been playing tricks on them. And so um, I don't know if this story is true or not. It was published a lot of times. Um, to me, it has a hint of... So there's a story in Polygamy where Mary Elizabeth Rollins... I don't know. There were several of the wives that were visited by angels. But there was one, I think it was Mary Elizabeth, where she's in her bed and this being appears, this angel. And she's so terrified that she throws the covers over her face and that she's trying to nudge her aunt to wake her up. And the aunt wakes up and she sees the angel go out the window, which is not how... Joseph Smith explains how angels leave. They go up in a shaft of light. Anyway, so my thoughts are... They get beamed up. They get beamed up, Scotty. They, yes. don't, they don't escape through the window. Yeah, so my thoughts are, um, if there's any truth in this one, um, could this give more light onto these other accounts of like Lucy Walker or Mary Elizabeth or others seeing an angel? It just makes you wonder about that. Makes you wonder. So going on... The, so I just posted here, this is just the Rockville Intelligencer's version of this story. Um, same thing, just a little shorter. And then we have this revelation from August of 1835. Behold, this is wisdom in me. Wherefore, marvel not, for the hour cometh, that I will drink of the fruit of the vine with you on the earth, and with Moroni, whom I have sent unto you to reveal the Book of Mormon, containing the fullness of my everlasting gospel, to whom I have committed the keys of the record of the stick of Ephraim. 
so this is a this is a reference in the Doctrine and Covenants, and to me, this um, I guess you could say this is Joseph naming the angel Moroni, um, and with Moroni, whom I've sent unto you to reveal the Book of Mormon. It's just kind of vague. It doesn't feel super clear because I guess you can interpret it different ways. But anyway, so that's another reference. Is this the first time it's been written down by the church? Well, the Times and Seasons was technically a, I'm pretty sure that was a church publication. Okay. You could see it that way. Um, but yeah, in church scripture, I would say this is the first time it's been spoken about or been written. And then in the, in the Elder's Journal in July of 1838, Joseph does specifically clarify who the angel was that visited him. So question four. How and where did you obtain the Book of Mormon? Answer. Moroni, the person who deposited the plates from whence the Book of Mormon was translated, in a hill in Manchester, Ontario County, New York, being dead and raised again therefrom, appeared unto me and told me where they were, and gave me directions how to obtain them. I obtained them and the Urim and Thummim with them, by the means of which I translated the plate, by the means of which I translated the plates, and thus came the Book of Mormon. Yeah, so he's clarifying that this is Moroni. Um, he was dead, was resurrected. So this resurrected being is coming to him. Um, also, again, um, he doesn't ever touch Moroni. So I don't know how he knows if Moroni is <coughs> of the Lord or of the devil. Because Joseph has that little secret thing in the scriptures where it's like, this is how you discern a good angel from a bad angel is you you try to you reach out to shake their hand. And if they're a resurrected being, they'll shake your hand and you'll feel something. And if they're not a resurrected being, they won't try to shake your hand because they won't try to deceive you. They'll just be like, I'm just here to deliver my message, dude. And if it's of the devil, then they'll try to shake your hand, but you won't feel anything. Unless you count like Moroni whopping him on the head. I'm not sure how Joseph knows. <laughs> he's he's out You know he's a real angel because he's smacked you on the he's head. Because he's smacking him around. <laughs> when did he come up with this, you have to shake their hand thing? Um, that's a good question. Um, and why was I taught that in seminary, but none of this other random It's in the Doctrine and Covenants. Um, <laughs> wait, random stuff as in like uh, all these <laughs> the other toad stories. And yeah, they don't like, want to tell you that story. The Toad story, I think, was published within E.D. Howe's book. And nobody likes, none of the members like E.D. Howe. Okay, so it was on April 1st of 1842 when he first came up with the testing angel shaking hand okay. theory. I don't know what to call that. But anyway, so none of these instances of him, his first vision... And the Moroni story, unless you count Moroni hitting him. And there is a first vision account where God touches Joseph's eyes. So maybe you could see that as, I don't know how else Joseph can know that they're resurrected beings unless he touches them. But Okay, so then Joseph Smith gives an account in 1839 in June. And this one's kind of interesting because I won't go into it here, but we can talk about it later if people are interested. But when the scribe was writing on Joseph's account, that he accidentally wrote down Nephi instead of Moroni. And this happens a lot. People just say it's a clerical error. And it might be because it's a lot of the same sentences. So I'll just read this. Many times in church history, the name Nephi is used instead of Moroni. While most of these come from a clerical mistake, I suspect that it wasn't always the case. According to Dan Vogel, Joseph Smith might have been testing out the names. So one thing that's interesting is we'll get to these accounts later. And so a lot of them are just the same sentence over and over again saying Nephi. And so it does feel like a clerical mistake. It's like somebody copy and pasted the wrong name kind of thing. Hmm. But there's other instances where it feels like Joseph is actually on purpose using Nephi. For example, these ones they're later that we'll talk about. Okay, so this one comes from Fayette Latham um, in May of 1870. So this is a late account. After this, Joseph spent about two years looking into this stone, telling fortunes, where to find lost things, and where to dig for money and other hidden treasure. About this time, he became concerned as to his future state of existence and was baptized, becoming thus a member of the Baptist church. Soon after joining the church, he had a singular dream, but he did not tell his father of his dream. A very large and tall man appeared to him, dressed in an ancient suit of clothes, and the clothes were bloody. And the man said to him that there was a valuable treasure buried many years since and not far from that place, and that he had now arrived for it to be brought to light for the benefit of the world at large. And if he would strictly follow his directions, he would direct him to the place where it was deposited in such a manner that he could obtain it. He then said to him that he would have to get a certain coverlet, which he described, and an old-fashioned suit of clothes of the same color and a napkin to put the treasure in, and go to a certain tree not far distant, and when there he would see other objects that he would take or keep in range and follow, until he was directed to stop, and there he would find the treasure that he was in pursuit of, and when he had obtained it, he must not lay it down until he placed it in the napkin. So whenever I read this account, I just think I'm just thinking of the angel in that aspect. This guy actually says that Joseph was baptized into the Baptist church. I don't know that there's any evidence for that because we know that Joseph, shortly after he and Emma were married, 1827, 28, he, he does try to join the Methodist Sunday school. But I don't think there's actually any records of Joseph being baptized in any other church. So that's just interesting that he says this. 
But Joseph was concerned in almost every account. He is concerned about his salvation. Um, but anyway, I thought that was interesting. So Fayette Lampham says that Joseph was baptized into the Baptist church. But again, I don't think there's any evidence for that. Um, but yeah, so the angel is, so he had a very singular dream. So it's not, it's not actually happening. And in his dream, he sees a very large and tall man dressed in an ancient suit of clothes. And my AI wouldn't, won't do anything gory. So um, just picture this guy covered in blood. So, um, so in the ancient folklore, a person was often killed to guard the treasure. And that person would be in the same state that they were killed in. So like, that would be why this man would be bloody. Another thing he says is that he, Joseph would have to wear an old fashioned suit of clothes of the same color and get a cover for this and get a napkin. I think there's other accounts of the plates being covered in muslin, but also the, the suit of clothing. So in other accounts, Joseph has to wear all black in order to get the plates and he has to go in the middle of night because this is the autumn equinox. It's a very magic world thing. So he goes in the middle of the night with Emma dressed in, in all black and then he collects the plates. And in fact, he's just moving. He's not really collecting them. He's just moving them from one hiding place to another, which I always thought was really funny because why not just leave them there? Like, was anybody going to find them? But he doesn't translate them for several years later. So I don't really understand that part. But anyway. Okay. So next is the Wilhelm Ritter von Weimetal. So uh, Wilhelm Wilhelm is another way, another name that he goes by. This is published in 1886. He said that by a dream, he was informed that at such a place in a certain hill in an iron box were some gold plates with curious engravings, which he must get and translate and write a book, that the plates were to be kept concealed from every human being for a certain time, some two or three years, that he went to the place and dug till he came to the stone that covered the box when he was knocked down, that he again attempted to remove the stone and was again knocked down. This attempt was made the third time and the third time he was knocked down. Then he explained, why can't I get it? <laughs> <laughs> or words to that effect. And when he saw a man standing over the spot, which to him appeared like a Spaniard, oh, you great son of Lucy, having a long beard coming down over his breast to about here, Smith putting his hand to the pit of his stomach, with his, the ghost's, throat cut from ear to ear and the blood streaming down. In all this narrative, there was not one word about visions of God or of angels or heavenly revelations. All his information was by that dream and that bleeding ghost. The heavenly visions and the messages of angels, etc., contained in Mormon books were afterthoughts, revised to order. Okay, so this one, he's dressed like a Spaniard. And what's interesting, his throat is cut, his throat is cut which is very reminiscent of Joseph's treasure digging days and his killing of animals where he cuts their throat. And also in the temple where they used to do this across the neck. Um, it's just super mormon -y and super occultic and everything like that. Oh, well, he points out that uh, there was no heavenly visions and messages of angels before this. They, they were all afterthoughts and revised yep. in order revised. to fit a, a better narrative. Yeah. And this was a dream. Okay, so this is going back to the Nephi Moroni thing. So this is this is an account from Mary Whitmer, and she always calls him Brother Nephi, but I'll let you read this. I have heard my grandmother, Mary Musselman Whitmer, say on several occasions that she was shown the plates of the Book of Mormon by a holy angel, whom she always called Brother Nephi. She undoubtedly refers to Moroni, the angel who had the plates in charge. It was at the time, she said, when the translation was going on at the house of the elder Peter Whitmer, her husband. Joseph Smith with his wife and Oliver Cowdery, whom David Whitmer a short time previous had brought up from Harmony, Pennsylvania, were all boarding with the Whitmers, and my grandmother, in having so many extra persons to care for, besides her own large household, was often overlooked with work to such an extent that she felt to be quite a burden. One evening when, after having done her usual day's work in the house, she went to the barn to milk the cows, she met a stranger carrying something on his back that looked like a knapsack. At first she was a little afraid of him, but when he spoke to her in a kind, friendly tone and began to explain to her the nature of the work which was going on in her house, she was filled with unexpressible joy and satisfaction. He then untied his knapsack and showed her a bundle of plates, which in size and appearance corresponded with the description subsequently given by the witnesses to the Book of Mormon. This strange person turned the leaves of the Book of Plates over, leaf after leaf, and also showed her the engravings upon them after which he told her to be patient and faithful in bearing her burden a little longer, promising that if she would do so, she should be blessed, and her reward would be sure if she proved faithful to the end. The personage then suddenly vanished with the plates, and where he went she could not tell. From that moment my grandmother was enabled to perform her household duties with comparative ease, and she felt no more inclination to murmur because her lot was hard. 
I knew my grandmother to be a good, noble, and truthful woman, and I have not the least doubt of her statement in regard to seeing the plates being strictly true. She was a strong believer in the Book of Mormon until the day of her death. Mother Whitmer died in Richmond, Ray County, Missouri, in January 1856. Okay, so yeah, then they go on and they talk about it more. So so it's interesting that this angel, who she always calls Brother Nephi, so this is, this account is given several times in the family, and each time I'm pretty sure it's it's Nephi. And then, and then sometimes sometimes her kids are like, no, she means Moroni. Um, but he's just this old man with a knapsack. So he's like mm -hmm. heavier set, older man. He doesn't, so in my mind, a translated being, I don't understand this. <laughs> Can translated beings change their appearance at will or are they translated in their perfect state? Because being an old man with that's sort of heavy set, well, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't know if that's like the epitome of what, I don't know, I don't understand. Oh, what a resurrected being what a resurrected is supposed being to be. Supposed to be. Exactly. Yeah. But, and again, feels very um, three like, three Nephite story. Like, folklore -y, um, Very folklore I just want to know. So she was just like, felt like a burden and her, she was murmuring because of her housework. Yeah, because so, there's more people in her house. So she's having to do more work. So Nephi showed her the plates. Like there are so few people who get to see the plates and it's her because she's overburdened. Uh-huh. I guess. I, I'm, it just seems random to me. Probably because it is. Okay, so this one is from David Whitmer. This is a different account. Uh, this is given November 27th of 1878 or published then. And I'll let you read it. Soon after Joseph sent for me, David Whitmer, to come to Harmony to get him and Oliver and bring them to my father's house. I did not know what to do. I was pressed with my work. I had some 20 acres to plow, so I concluded I would finish plowing and then go. I got up one morning to the field, found between five and seven acres of my ground had been plowed during the night. I don't know who did it, but it was done just as I would have done it myself, and the plow was left standing in the furrow. This enabled me to start sooner. When I arrived at Harmony, Joseph and Oliver were coming toward me and met me some distance from the house. Oliver told me that Joseph had informed him when I started from home, where I had stopped the first night, how I read the sign of the tavern, where I stopped the next night, etc., and that I would be there that day before dinner. And this was why they had come out to meet me, all of which was exactly as Joseph had told Oliver, at which I was greatly astonished. When I was returning to Fayette with Joseph and Oliver, all of us riding in the wagon, Oliver and I had an old-fashioned wooden spring seat and Joseph behind us. While traveling along in a clear open place, a very pleasant, nice-looking old man suddenly appeared by the side of our wagon and saluted us with, Good morning, it is very warm at the same time wiping his face or forehead with his hand. We returned to the salutation, and by a sign from Joseph, I invited him to ride if he was going our way. But he said very, but he said very pleasantly, No, I am going to Camorra. This name was something new to me. I did not know what Camorra meant. We all gazed at him and at each other, and as I looked around inquiringly of Joseph, the old man instantly disappeared so that I did not see him again. So Joseph F. Smith asks, Did you notice his appearance? David Whitmer says, I think I did. He was, I should think, about five feet eight or nine inches tall and heavy set, about such a man as James Vaucleave there, but heavier. His face was large. He was dressed in a suit of brown woolen clothes. His hair and beard were white, like Brother Pratt's, but his beard was not so heavy. I also remember that he had on his back a sort of knapsack with something in, shaped like a book. It was the messenger who had the plates who had taken them from Joseph just prior to starting from Harmony. Soon after our arrival home, I saw something which led me to believe that the plates were placed or concealed in my father's barn. I frankly asked Joseph if my supposition was right, and he told me it was. Sometime after this, my mother was going to milk the cows when she was met out near the yard by the same old man, judging by her description of him, who said to her, You have been very faithful and diligent in your labors, but you are tired because of the increase of your toil. It is proper, therefore, that you should receive a witness that your faith may be strengthened. Thereupon he showed her the plates. My father and mother had a large family of their own. The addition to it, therefore, of Joseph, his wife Emma, and Oliver very greatly increased the toil and anxiety of my mother. Although she had never complained, she had sometimes felt that her labor was too much, or at least she was perhaps beginning to feel so. This circumstance, however, completely removed all such feelings and nerved her up for her increased responsibilities. So I guess her seeing Nephi Moroni helped her not complain anymore and let them go about their duties to translate. David Whitmer is her son? Yeah, David Whitmer is her son. Yeah, the one of the so they both, three witnesses. So they both saw the same guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so again, heavy set guy, five foot eight or nine inches, um, dressed in brown, 
big beard. Why is this Moroni Nephi not the same being that Joseph Smith saw in his bedroom? <laughs> I would just like to point out that she probably was overburdened. And why did Joseph and Emma just like take over their house and give this old woman so much to do? You should right. be taking care of her. So the story of Joseph Smith being visited by an angel is documented three years before the first vision. And so 1829 is when the story of the angel comes out. And then 1832 is when the first vision comes out. So it's, it's a little bit predates the first vision, but not by very much because they're both late and it doesn't appear in the newspapers until 1829. And then the angel is not named Moroni until 1830. I think it's actually 34, but I wrote down 35 because it's not Oliver. It's Lehman Copley who actually says it first, to my knowledge. And then in church publications, it's first published by Oliver Cowdery in the Times and Seasons. And then by Joseph Smith in the Elder's Journal in 1838. So historically, in a historical sense, this is not the 200th anniversary for Moroni. That's not until 34. Um, and also, if you're judging by the angel cropping up in Mormon history, it's not until... Um, 2029. Okay, so yeah, so he's a little old man with a beard. He's a toad. A, a toad. He's a man with a monkey. He's a hiker when he meets David Whitmer and Joseph. Very inconsistent. That's fun. Yeah, I'm very folklory. I just think this is all super interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Reading all these is very reminiscent of, of the treasure digging and the folklore and stuff like that. It it almost like zero it, resembles it feels like it's, the story it's we like know the now. The beginning of it starts as literally treasure digging and then ends up being an angel and it like just yeah. Like yeah. slowly so moves. You understand the church history a lot better or all these sources better when you understand that it's coming from a treasure digging folklore magic worldview. So I hope you guys enjoyed all these sources about Nephi, Moroni, Toad. Mm -hmm. everything angel ghost man. angel ghost man bleeding ghost yeah so if you want to support us support me um please subscribe to patreon you can do the tiers it's five ten twenty and if you do the twenty dollar tier um we'll send, you a, free we'll send book. you a free book and and follow us on youtube support our publishing company we have three mormon books out if you want those analyzes wife number 19 william smith's really on mormonism and the Nauvoo expositor and then we have another, we have an actual queer book coming out. The whole focus of our company is going to be. It's um, called Outsider and it will be releasing February 6th of 2024. Yeah. And, it's really and our, our author is from New Zealand. And she's amazing. She's a lawyer. She's so cool. She's an amazing writer. Yeah. Um, you can check that out at adinapublishers.com. You should be able to pre-order it on Amazon. So mm -hmm. yeah. Oh yes. Pre-orders, please. Pre-orders. Yeah. Um, yeah. Subscribe, like, share. Um, Patreon, all that stuff. Um, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day and tune in for more Mormon history random facts. Okay, bye guys. Bye.